and welcome to uh, this uh, Purple Line webinar. Uh, this is uh, Jason Williams and Bruce Nash here at the DNA Learning Center in Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And uh, we're happy to present this one hour introduction to the new and upgraded Purple Line, uh, which is a feature that allows you to do metabarcoding, microbiome, uh, and eDNA analysis in the classroom. So we're really excited to present this as sort of a walkthrough to get you started using these features. We're gonna tell you a little bit of background about the project, a little bit of background about the Cyverse tools that you're using, and also the DNA Learning Center materials that we've developed in order to help you use this in the classroom successfully. Let me give you a little bit of information about uh, the webinar so that uh, you can more effectively make use of this. The first thing to know is that uh, everything that we're doing now is going to be recorded. So that'll be posted later in case you miss any part or you want to go back to it. You'll be able to view the recording and that should be available within a day or so after we're done here. The second thing is through Zoom, uh, you have the ability to ask questions. So what you should be seeing is that you have a question and answer panel uh, that is available to you at the bottom there. And so all you'll need to do is uh, submit a question. We will be able to see that and um, we will answer those questions. Um, part of the reason why we want to do this live and not just a, a static recording is so that we can interact with you. So please, as you have questions of any, any time, send them. And if you don't get a chance to ask that question today, go ahead and uh, you've gotten several emails from me perhaps, or you can go and I'll show you in a little while on DNA Subway and leave us some feedback so that we can help you with whatever questions you have. The way that we'll do this is we're going to present a few slides uh, just to give you a little bit of orientation and background, and then we are going to uh, give you an actual live walkthrough. Uh, I'm going to do some part of that on the data handling and the project creation, and then Bruce, who has really been perfecting the microbiome metabarcoding line, purple line, uh, will really take you in detail through uh, most of the steps of the workflow. So to get started, what I'm going to do is just pull up a PowerPoint that we have prepared. And I'm going to share my screen and take you through the first set of slides. And then I'll hand it over to Bruce uh, as we go into some other uh, parts of details. So I'm going to share my entire desktop so you can see everything. And uh, these slides and the, the recorded materials, as I said, will be available for anybody that wants them later. Um, first, we uh, have already introduced ourselves. So we're both uh, colleagues here at the DNA Learning Center. And uh, later on, we'll also thank all of our DNA Learning Center colleagues who really helped uh, develop and push uh, these materials to where they are today. Um, this is the agenda sort of summarized, um, particular uh, as regard these slides, we're gonna give you an introduction to metabarcoding and microbiome. Then uh, um, Bruce is gonna do that. I'm gonna come back and give you the introduction to Subway and show you how to make sure you can upload your data to Cybers. And then Bruce will be back to go ahead and do a walkthrough of the purple line. Uh, I have the slides up. So actually, Bruce, if you want to go ahead, you can actually sure. just walk through them. And uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Sounds good. So uh, and for those of you who have not heard of metabarcoding as a term, maybe you've heard of microbiomes. So metabarcoding is using uh, DNA barcode regions. Those are variable regions in the genome to identify species in a mixture. Okay. The one that most people have heard of is microbiomes. Uh, this is you know, any collection of microbes that you can identify uh, with the barcode region. It's often 16S or ribosomal uh, RNA gene. Uh, we've also developed some tools for environmental DNA or eDNA. So not for microbes, but instead uh, our first round of this is with fish. And I'll give you a little bit more information about that. Uh, for the fish, we've uh, adapted some uh, 12S ribosomal RNA uh, primers. And we look at that region, but we're also working on cytochrome oxidase subunit one, uh, which uh, can help with a, a broader group of eukaryotes. And we have plans for plants and fungal barcode regions too, but we haven't started that yet. So uh, we think this is a really great platform for introducing uh, people to next generation sequencing, high throughput data, and to uh, ecology or environmental uh, 
biodiversity studies. Uh, it's got some real advantages over collecting organisms. One, it's non-destructive. You can just get some dirt or some water and get the DNA directly from there. And that will give you a good idea of uh, what the creatures are in that sample. It's very sensitive. You can detect many species at once. Uh, it doesn't require growth, which uh, previously was a huge problem for microbes. Many microbes are hard to grow. Uh, it's also easier than taxonomy. Uh, so taxonomists are uh, a rare breed these days. And with big efforts to identify biodiversity, it really isn't possible to do all of the work, especially for these mixtures uh, by ta taxonomists. And uh, another nice thing, it's non-destructive. So you can study things like vertebrates without having any uh, real problems with uh, NIH or other organizations. And you can also get water or a little bit of dirt from almost anywhere with very little permission. Although often you have to assure that that's true. Okay. Uh, so when you go to do metabarcoding, you have this mixture uh, and you want to uh, first isolate the DNA. Uh, and we've developed some affordable tools that allow you to isolate the DNA from samples, including difficult samples like muddy water or soil. Uh, you amplify the barcode region and you get this mixture. And then you have to sequence it. Uh, we use Illumina sequencing, uh, which is sort of the, the current state of the art for high throughput sequencing for smaller fragments. It's got a relatively low error rate. It's very cheap compared to other sequencing uh, platforms. And it is sufficient for a good measure of the biodiversity in samples. Uh, for our projects, we decided to adapt uh, a program called Chime, which is one of the pipelines that allows you to uh, analyze next generation sequencing and look at the biodiversity there. Initially, we used Chime, uh, you know, sort of Chime 1. It didn't need the one. And, but now we use Chime 2, which is uh, open source and developed by the community. So it's under constant development, and it uh, is really very good for what we're doing. Okay, so in the end, Chime 2 will uh, identify the variability in the sequences in your sample, bin them, so you know, count up how many of each type of sequence there are, and allow you to do a bunch of other things uh, with the data, including looking at fractions or relative amounts of species or other assigned taxonomic, taxonomic groups in your sample. Now, it, uh, for those of you who are uh, going gray like me, uh, you'll see that uh, you can do tens or hundreds of thousands of reads per sample in some cases. And uh, the cost we're aiming to get this to is about 10 or $15 per sample. The, the commercial cost right now is maybe 50 to 75 uh, dollars, depending on how much you have a sequencing center do. So we're trying very hard to make this more approachable. Uh, so part of how I'm doing that, uh, or we're doing that, is by uh, coming up with ways to mix many samples together so that we can do a lot of uh, samples in one sequencing run. So we currently aim to get about 400 samples into a MySeq run, and MySeq is a relatively small throughput platform for Illumina. Uh, to do that, I, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail. We use indexes, small sequences that are specific to a sample or to an amplicon, which we attach to the barcode region PCR primers. And that allows us to identify the sequences that come from a particular sample in the big mixture, okay? On top of that, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, we do this again. So we attach Illumina adapters after an in the initial PCR and add another set of indexes. And that allows us to pull samples from a project or from a particular faculty member. And we can sort all of the samples from that particular project into one bin 
And then within the bin, we have the internal indexes that tell the samples apart. Okay. okay. So our initial work on this was started in 2016, at which point we did a proof of concept uh, set of experiments with high school students, and we did it in command line. So we had 33 teams of 60, with 63 students, and we, they did a great deal of work. They got through almost 300 samples and 15 billion base pairs. And they studied a bunch of uh, different types of samples, including uh, the microbiomes of invertebrates, uh, in water, in dirt, in plants. Uh, uh, and they had a bunch of different questions. And uh, I bring this up because that's one of the major things about this, which is great. You can have students do many different projects, but they all use the same technology. So it's very powerful, okay? So next one. Uh, and just some examples very quickly. I won't go into the details of this, these slides. Uh, they worked on ticks and found human pathogens, including one very, very scary uh, uh, tick that had a huge number of reads for rickettsia. Next. Uh, black-legged ticks with different pathogens in them. And in this case, the group also showed that ticks had different microbiomes in different parks or locations on Long Island. So they, they could see some pattern to their uh, microbiomes, which was interesting. Uh, my favorite project was a very uh, strange one. A group decided to look at different cemeteries because they thought that embalming which has changed over the centuries, has, uh, could have an effect on the microbiomes. And so they looked at Civil War, revolutionary, and modern soil from cemeteries, and they hypothesized that uh, the soil would have different microbes because of you know, some sort of toxic effect from the embalming fluid. So next. And what they found was, in fact, the the Civil War cemeteries are very different from the other ones. And uh, during the Civil War, arsenic was used uh, as the embalming uh, chemical. So it's kind of a fun thing. Okay. Uh, as I said, we also are working on fish. We're doing this at least in part with NOAA, who wants to use it to manage fish stocks or at least keep track of fish to a certain point because it's cheaper than big ships and may allow for continuous sampling from buoys. Uh, right, uh, and there's some data that this works uh, at least at one, at some level, it's not very quantitative though. Next. Okay, so I, I don't know that I need to go into the details, but to do this, we had to adapt CHIME 2, which was for microbiomes for use with 12S barcodes and we had to develop our own uh, fish eDNA database. So with the sequences for this 12S re region, and we tried to validate it by using a set of data from a colleague, a uh, collaborator at Rockefeller called Mark Stokel. Uh, and interestingly, uh, it's actually a theme in the literature. Our pipeline, which was trying to, uh, and different from Mark's group, uh, identified many overlapping species with them, but also identified some that Mark didn't and missed some that he didn't. So uh, between us, we identify more than each of us identify. And that's sort of a little warning that when you do these studies, uh, you get a lot of things, but you don't always get everything that you could get. And of course, we're trying to make that better. We're constantly trying to update our database and looking at why the two platforms are slightly different. All right. Okay. Uh, so before we go into this next section, which we're going to talk a little bit about DNA Subway, we actually have a question uh, from Cindy uh, for Bruce. So I'll let you uh, answer that live. And if you read the question for all of our participants, uh, since they won't be able to see it, just us. Uh that's a good question, Cindy. Uh, generally, uh, if you pull two PCR reactions of about 25 microliters that have a good signal on an agro shell, you'll have enough. Uh, because of the way we do this, 
uh, you don't have to worry about the li library prep. You would send us your samples that have been indexed, and then we do the secondary PCR here to add the Illumina adapters. We do the, the cleaning, should you do it with us, and uh, we, we would handle setting up the sequencing room. And I haven't got, gotten to this yet, but we have some grants that can support some next generation sequencing when implemented in course-based undergraduate research experiences that I'll mention near the end of the time. But, uh, you know, the, the basic, uh, you know, it's something like 500 nanograms or something like that, but it's a, I'd have to look up exactly amount, the amount and it depends on the length of the barcode too. And just for the sake of all of the participants who cannot see the questions, uh, the question was what amount of library prep would individual groups uh, need to complete if they're using the DNALC uh, approach. Uh, and so keep those questions coming. I see one yeah. or two more and we are gonna continue on now, uh, but then we'll pause and, and get to some questions that as they right. accumulate. Just answer uh, But there's a quick question yeah. if you read that uh, question and then we'll- Kevin we'll asked if we would do the microbiome for some mosquitoes if he sent us mosquitoes. Uh, that's not what we do. We're not a microbiome service. We would support you if you did the DNA isolation and PCR on your end. And then uh, with DNA Subway's purple line, we'd hope that you would analyze the data with your students. That's the goal of what we're doing, okay? Okay, thanks, Bruce. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue. And again, uh, you go ahead and answer those questions. And as we see them, uh, we will try our best to respond to all of those questions. Okay, so getting into the analysis part, which is DNA Subway, a platform which uh, many of you may already be familiar with, but some of you may not, uh, really is a, a streamlined way to access bioinformatics tools. And the whole design concept of DNA Subway is really to teach important concepts in biology and bioinformatics. So oftentimes we've taken existing software and we like to use the same tools uh, that you would use as a professional bioinformatician but streamline them and tailor them to what would suit the needs of educators. And really our ultimate goal, as Bruce alluded to, is to drive the ability uh, for educators to use inquiry-based or we'd even say course-based research in their classrooms so that you can actually work with this data, actually publish with this data. In fact, actually several uh, people who are investigators and not even uh, doing teaching themselves also make use of Subway because we think we've designed uh, quite a nice interface. When it comes to Purple Line, as also Bruce mentioned, this is an implementation of Chime 2. So it's not a software that we at the DNA Learning Center create. We didn't write Chime 2, um, but we have actually wrapped Chime 2 into DNA Subway and we paired it with a lot of value adds. Uh, so one is what Bruce uh, told you just a little bit about and what we have some programs and we'll mention to those uh, at the end again. Uh, publishing or rather pairing purple line with wet lab protocols so that you can actually do the first half of the experiment to generate the data. So you may already have existing data that you want to take a look at, or you may just be getting started with that point. But once you have data sets available, then you can bring them to Subway and then develop all sorts of class, uh, classroom activities. One of the advantages is that the DNA Learning Center has developed this in cooperation with Cyverse and so you can handle real data sets, large size data sets. And so that's the part that I'm gonna take you into. Uh, once you create a project using Subway, then if you've used Chime before, uh, these steps will be familiar, but Bruce is really gonna go through in a little bit more detail. I'm also gonna point out to you where there are some written learning materials so that you can go through these at your own pace. The first step after uh, creating a project and validating the metadata that you've assigned to the project, which is often the trickiest part, uh, is then going through the point of demultiplexing the samples so that you can separate samples according to their barcodes. Then there's a bit of uh, sequence quality control, and that is uh, finally followed by determinations of that diversity. So through species rich richness, which is the alpha diversity, and then also looking at other ca uh, calculations and visualizations and it's really quite powerful, so I'm excited to show you that because you can really play with uh, some interactive things. The first part, which is the one that I'm going to cover, is Cyverse account and data management. Uh, the, the 
uh, Purple Line actually requires you to get a Cybers account. It's free. And we actually encourage, this is a common question, we encourage every student that's going to be making use of Subway to have their own accounts. So if you are an educator and you have a group of 15, 20, 30 students, whatever it is, uh, they should all go ahead and get their own account. And although I won't show you every single detail of what's possible with the Cybers account, uh, there are some really wonderful features, including data sharing. So you can set up a folder that everyone within your, uh, within your class can share from. I'm also going to show you live how do you actually get started with uploading those data. As we said, the value of the Purple Line is that you can work with real uh, research size data sets, and so you can handle that all. As these slides allude to, there is an important or a couple of important uh, websites that you need to know about. So as I'm sharing my screen, I'm going to share those with you now. The first thing that you uh, need to do if you've never used any of these tools before is sign up for a free Cybers account. And so if you go to cybers.org, uh, you will see instructions there under uh, about or about products where you can go ahead and actually get connected to uh, Cybers. Uh, the next thing you're going to do once you have your Cybers account is I would recommend you take a look at some of the documentation that we've produced. And to find that, one of the easiest places to go is learning.cybers.org. So at learning.cybers.org, you'll find an introduction to all of the Cybers products and services. But in addition, uh, what we're going to take you through is the DNA Subway product, of course, and then also how do you upload data. Let me start with actually the data upload. So if you go into the Learning Center and go to Platform Guides, there is the data store and you can go ahead and click on the data store guide. Keep in mind on the left hand side, there is a search functionality. So if there's anything that you need to find, you can go to the search and you'll be able to find it um, if you if you lost track. Um, the tool that we recommend that most people use is something called CyberDuck. I'm going to rather quickly take you through just to have an idea of what CyberDuck looks like. But once you use it, it takes less than five minutes to set up and it really creates drag and drop functionality to move data from your local computer, wherever you might have that data, up to the Cybers data store. Once your data is on Cybers, then you'll be able to see it from within Subway. So the steps are here. I'm going to go through them just enough to give you an idea and orientation. So if you're doing this on your own for the first time, you won't have very many problems. The first thing is to go to the CyberDuck website. CyberDuck is a standalone tool which is available for uh, Linux and for, um, rather it's available for Windows and for Mac. It's not available for Linux. So there are some other, uh, there are some other ways that you might wanna do things if you are making uh, use of that operating system. Once you go to CyberDuck and it's a bit slow today, what you're gonna do is download also this thing called the configuration profile. And that configuration profile will allow you to uh, sort of bookmark uh, the Cybers data store. Now, I already have these things done, so I don't need to follow these instructions. But the only other instruction that you'll need to follow once you download these tools is to input your Cybers username and your Cybers password. So I've already got these things running. And let me show you what it looks like once you have it running successfully. The first thing that it looks like is that once you have followed those three steps to configure, you will see that you have uh, a bookmark to the, um, you will have a bookmark to the Cybers data store. The next thing that you'll do is actually double click on this in order to connect. And I've already connected in my experience, it takes about 30 seconds. What you expect to see is that you expect to see a listing of all of the files in your Cybers data store. Now, while I'm uh, explaining this, a quick question uh, from the chat, although we encourage you to use the Q&A feature, uh, because then we can see those questions more easily. Uh, Cy CyberDuck is available for Mac or Windows. So if you have either Mac or Windows, you can use that. There are other options for Linux. And if you check on the Learning Center, you'll find those options as well. OK, the other question that we got so far is that if you uh, want a copy of the PowerPoint, yes, you'll be able to get those. They'll be available to you um, after the webinar is concluded. OK, so coming back to uh, what we see here, this is a listing of files on the Cybers data store. Once I have those, I am looking good because I can easily move files 
between there and um, between the cyber data store, which appears on the left hand side, and my computer, which is anything um, that's not in that window. Many of you might be familiar with Dropbox, so it's really drag and drop. So on my desktop here, I have a fake folder uh, filled with also fake FASTQ files, but this is, uh, of course, just a demonstration. What you want to do once you've connected is simply drag that over to the left-hand side, uh, drag it into your personal data store. Uh, within a few seconds, uh, it'll do the authentication. And on a good internet connection, which I'm using wireless, so I wouldn't really do this with real stuff, uh, you can expect to transfer approximately 100 gigabytes of data in about 30 minutes. So it depends on your internet connection. Once you move that data over to Cybers, you don't need to worry about how do I find it in Subway or is there some special place to put it. Uh, we'll show you that in a minute. All you have to do is get it onto Cybers. Okay, so back to Cybers for a moment and actually using Subway. Now, when you sign up for your Cybers account, what you're actually going to be taken to is the Cybers user portal, which is at user.cybers.org. And what you want to do from there is request access to DNA Subway if you haven't already done so. So it'll take a few minutes to register. You'll get a link and you'll be um, able to come back to this page. But if you notice on my list here, I don't have DNA Subway listed. So if that's the case, you can go up to available services. And from there, you'll see DNA Subway and you can click the request access link. It's a short form and you shouldn't uh, have any problems doing that. And, and again, we encourage everyone to go ahead and create their account. Okay, I only have two more things I wanna show you and then I'll return to questions. But what I wanna show you is, okay, once we've uploaded this data, how am I gonna be able to get this up to, um, and to use in, in DNA Subway? And I'm gonna close this because I haven't actually really transferred anything, it was just a demonstration. Uh, if we go to DNA Subway, uh, dot, uh, .org. Uh, this is the DNA Subway homepage. And I can go ahead and make this full screen. And from here, you're going to enter your same Cybers credentials. Uh, so your Cybers username and your Cybers password. And it'll take a moment. And then what you're going to see are any projects that you've created in the past. If you're a new user, you might not have anything here, but one of the value adds with Subway is that anything that you create, there's no save button. It will always save. And if you start a job, especially with Purple Line, where some jobs may take several minutes, maybe an hour to complete, uh, then you can go ahead and walk away from those jobs and let them run. What you'll do and what I'll cover before I hand over to Bruce is how you actually create a project. So uh, to create a project on the left-hand side here, I have a menu. And today we're talking about purple line. I'm going to show you the documentation and then you can go and read about some of the other lines. But on purple line, I click a purple square. And what you'll need to know in advance is what format your sequencing, uh, your sequence reads are. I happen to know there's test data available for some of these single end reads, so I might choose that. Also, currently there are different file formats. We support Illumina Cassava 1.8. If you have questions, we can also answer those later. And then the next thing that you'll do is have a project name. I'm just going to call mine's webinar demo 222. And then you'll click continue. Once you've done that, you've created a project. And when you go into the manage data section, uh, which I'll talk about just getting the files from Cyverse, and Bruce is going to handle some important things about metadata. If you click on manage data, you'll see the first button that's there is to enable you to add from Cybers, and when you click on that, on the left-hand side, you'll see your Cybers username, and you'll see all the data sets that we just saw a few moments ago in Cyberduck. So you have this, uh, you have this uh, automatic link, and we'll talk more about how you choose that. The very last thing we're going to show you before I turn this over to Bruce is the Cybers Learning Center again. If you come back here to Platform Guides this time, and you click on DNA Subway you'll find a link to the DNA subway guide. And on the left-hand side there, there is the instructions for the purple line. And from those, you can scroll through um, and find really detailed instructions, much more than we'll be able to convey to you in a webinar. But the idea of the webinar is that you'll be able to go through these with a little bit more comfort and ease. So I'm ready to turn this over to Bruce. I see we have a few questions. 
and I'm going to address those uh, as much as we can. And then we have about a half hour left, so we want to use the bulk of that time really uh, to go through uh, Purple Line. So one of the first questions is, can a university outside the U.S. participate in this program? So if you're outside the U.S., you do have access to DNA Subway and you can use it. Bruce did mention some grants that we have where we are working with individual schools. Those grants, uh, for the most part, really are U.S.-based. But to make use of Subway and all the resources, those are free to use. Uh, I've answered the question about the PowerPoint, so that is available online. The next question is, what are the data privacy policies of Cybers? Is data accessible by others or secure to the account? Very good question. Uh, your data is your data. If you go to cybers.org, uh, there is a link in the About Us, I believe, and also at the bottom of the website on our privacy policies. But once you upload data to, to Cybers, no one else has access. Uh, the only people who theoretically have access are sysadmins sys if you need to get some support. Now that said, please go back to the data store guide because it shows you in Cyverse that you can type in the name of your other collaborators or students and you can choose to give them access to your data sets, which is probably what most educators wanna do. And it's really simple and it's ready to go in seconds. So if you've uploaded a 30 gigabyte data set and you wanna share it with your classroom, go back to uh, the learning center and you'll find the instructions in the data store guide. And if you have more questions, please send those along. Um, if you have a Cybers user account and you don't remember your name, go to user.cybers.org. That was the next question. And from there, there'll be a link to reset your password. Okay, the next question, two more, and then we're gonna have to move on and we'll take as many as we can. The next question is how much data can you have on Cybers? Is there a limit? And the answer is with Cybers, uh, we encourage people uh, to think about uh, there is a limit of, of 100 gigabytes. If you have more than that uh, to upload, then let us know. There's a form that you can fill out and you can have up to 10 uh, terabytes with justification, but we do need to document that. Uh, so you can actually really work with fairly large data sets. Um, there is a question from Kevin, uh, which I think Bruce might want to comment on, but the question is, what is the timeline from sample collection and PCR prep uh, to receiving sequence results in the DNA Learning Center? We are not providing the sequencing as a service uh, just on the in the ordinary case. Um, there are some workshops which Bruce will talk to you about at the end of this webinar. And if you're a participant in those workshops or if we are a formal collaborator on some grants, then we do in, in some cases have the ability to support sequencing. If that's not the case, then the recommendation is that you work either with a local sequencing center or there are actually many commercially available companies uh, that you can work with. Now, what is free is the protocols that we are developing that potentially reduce the cost of sequencing. If you wanna use those and adapt those, those we will be making available so that you'll be able to do that on your own. Um, so I think I've answered all the questions for now. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and invite Bruce to share his screen. Okay. And he's going to take you through the rest, and we'll be monitoring questions. So keep them coming. We'll do as many as we can. So, in, you know, in, to elaborate on Kevin's question, if you're part of our programs, uh, which I'll come back to later, then we would give you sequencing support. And under those circumstances, the sequencing uh, needs to be arranged uh, with the other people in the program because we pool the samples from many different people and. Uh, depending on how many people need samples done, there may be only one or two runs in a semester. Uh, usually the timing of the semesters will determine when everyone will need things. And we try to work around that by talking to everyone who's gonna be on the same run, okay? So uh, let me make that available for you if you can't, one second. Okay. Ah, there we go. Okay, you should be able to share your screen now. All right. And uh, what I want to do is actually go into DNA Subway and show you a little bit of how the, this pipeline works. Okay, so uh, as Jason showed you, you have, to, you have to know a little bit about the data to set up your project. You have to know if it's a, uh, single end or paired end reads. And uh, 
either you're the one who's ordered this or we will tell you one way or the other, okay? Uh, but once you're in to the project, uh, you can then uh, load data from Cybers, so from the data store, and you do that through managed data, okay? So I'm gonna, you know, start over with my own project here, okay? I'm gonna do paired end this time. It's a Lumina sequencing, that's what we do, and at the moment, that's all we support. So uh, we are willing to discuss supporting other platforms if you need it, okay? So we'll, we'll call it uh, Cyverse Webinar. And you can describe it if you want, but you don't have to, okay? So I'm gonna to go to Manage Data. And in Manage Data, now I have this beautiful link, big purple link, to add data from Cybers, okay? Now, uh, I was here earlier, so in fact, I can go to last location and go directly where I want, but uh, in general, when you're working with shared data, you go to shared data. If you have your own data, you go to your folder. And if someone shares with you, there will be uh, something behind shared with me. Okay, so I'm gonna go to shared data. This is data from workshop participants from a few years ago that I'm gonna use today. So I have to find where it's at and uh, you'd either know for your own samples or uh, if you're working with us, we'll let you know where they are. This is from when we were doing the NIH SEPA microbiome work early on. Okay. So I'm loading this up and one of the faculty who came to our workshop, Paula Krunquist, had some interesting samples and I'm gonna load her data. So I'm just following the links to the folder in the data store where her data is. And I'm gonna use a nice function, which is I want all the sequence files here. So I'm gonna just hit add all FASTQ files in this directory. You can in fact add uh, individual files if you want. Uh, but this we find is best for a project and unless you know that you have some bad data and you want to exclude it for some reason. Okay, so first round, this is what I usually do. Okay, so this is telling the purple line that these are the files it should use for analyses. Okay, uh, and the other thing you have to upload uh, or create is a metadata file. So the metadata file is really crucial to the whole analysis it tells Chime2 what samples go with which sequences, and it also lets you add metadata. So metadata could be the temperature, the location, whether or not something has a control or not. Uh, and metadata has, for Chime2, has some really specific requirements. So you have to be uh, careful with what you're doing. Uh, Chime2 has documentation on that, and our manual with its walkthrough has some information for you there too. Uh, if you've never done this before, we've actually uh, tried to make it simple to set up a really uh, bare bones metadata file that will align with your sequences by hitting a button called, you know, it's labeled create new. So if you hit create new, you won't have metadata, but at least you'll have a minimal metadata table that you can then, uh, that will be valid and tell Chime2 uh, the relationship between the sequences that you've uploaded and uh, that table. Okay, so if I hit create new, it will read the folder and assign sample IDs that are consistent with your sequence names and a very boring description, which you could change. Now, I, we don't have a lot of time, so I won't go into all of the details, but you can add columns. If you wanna add metadata here, uh, you can then assign them as categorical. That might be yellow versus blue or yes versus no or numeric. Uh, you can label that column. And this is, this is where you can put in your metadata to tell your samples apart and tell Chime2 which things are samples of the same type as opposed to, to a, a different type, okay? So I'm not going to use that now because we have a better metadata table and I'm just gonna sort of skip 
over to a different project so I can show you some of this in detail. Uh, so uh, Paula's data, I've analyzed it. I, and uh, if I go in to manage data again, I can show you her metadata file. Uh, in fact, by sneakily pretending to edit it. Okay, so I could go in here and edit, but here's her metadata. She has descriptions of some samples. These are wolves. Uh, they have a sample name and description that is the same. And her question, her research question was, is there a difference between wild and captive wolves? And she had access to both, okay? So uh, the treatment column tells Chime2 something that can be used to compare things. There are also some negative controls in here uh, uh, just to check on how things were going. So you can manipulate this, you can save it, or you can go back. Uh, you can create more than one metadata file if you want to analyze the data in different ways. Uh, you can rename your metadata files. Uh, there's a little bit of functionality there, okay? So I'm gonna close out that window. And now I'm gonna to go to a section called demultiplex, but it's already run in this project. So I'm gonna, again, just for the sake of this demonstration, go into a different one uh, where demultiplexing hasn't happened. So demultiplexing is when you take these many sequences that are in fast Q files that have hundreds of thousands of sequences in them. And with the metadata file and Chime2, you're going to separate them into the particular samples, okay? Now we, when we run our, our samples, we actually demultiplex uh, before we put things into Chime 2s, which is why we have multiple sequence files for forward and reverse reads uh, and for each sample. So in fact, uh, for us, what we're actually doing is just telling Chime 2 which files go with which samples and, and what the metadata is, okay? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good question. And luckily, we're in a good spot for that. Hmm? Uh, yes, yeah, right. So how do you validate your metadata file? Okay, and I'm sorry I skipped over that. Uh, you follow the steps that are in, in there. So I'm gonna go back to that project that I just made where we have, uh, you, know, you know, create a metadata file again, and uh, I'm gonna save it, okay? Now if I go back, uh, I have this link that says validate. If I click on validate, it's gonna check for any errors. If there are errors, it'll show, uh, sort of give me some uh, clues as to what is uh, wrong. There are no errors found here and no warnings found here. That's not surprising because this was using our tool. And then you hit run to actually validate it, okay? So uh, thank you for pointing out that I didn't show you how to do that. So uh, once that's done, you can run the demultiplexing. Okay? And demultiplexing, I've already described, uh, but during this process, you also do a quality control check. So uh, the quality control is gonna look at the sequence reads and the quality of the sequencing data at different points in, in the sequence, okay? Uh, you can change the number of sequences you sample from the overall data set at this point. Uh, and that number, you don't wanna make it enormously big, uh, but you wanna get a good sample of your sequences. And so we often use 10,000 as our number. You can use a smaller number, in which case you get a little bit more sampling error. Uh, I wouldn't go much above that unless you had a really specific reason uh, to, to look at that. Okay, so I'm not gonna hit DMUX reads. Well, I can hit DMUX reads and I'll start processing. And just a warning, these are big data sets and the processing can take quite a long time. Uh, it's now running and I can close this out and it will run in the background. It's now sent to a queue and will be run when there's space on the server to run this analysis. Okay, uh, now I'll jump out of there 
and I'll go into my Krimquist one so that I can show you what the results look like. So here's, uh, I've gone back into demultiplex reads and once it's run, I ran this with a very small sample size. You get a summary, which when I click on this link, will uh, give me some information about how things went. So one, it says that the uh, one of the samples has only 72 reads and the maximum is a pretty big 333,000 reads. So there's a big span here. Uh, I guess the hope is that the negative controls are the ones with hardly any reads and that the uh, experimental samples have lots of reads from the wolf scat. Okay. You can also look at the quality plot. Okay. And in the quality plot, you get a readout of the quality of the sequence at different uh, regions, uh, both for the forward and the reverse read. So I'm just trying to expand this a bit so I can see it better and you can see what I'm looking at. Uh, the, the score here is a FRED score. It's a logarithmic measure of the quality of the reads at different points in the Illumina run. And quite dramatically in this sampling, you can see this huge drop at around 100. And then there's another drop later uh, as you get towards the end of the two reads. Now, uh, this is a little tricky because in fact, I know that this is an artificial thing that has occurred because I have a mixture of reads in this particular sequencing run. So that very dramatic drop might not represent something real. And uh, in fact, we're using uh, a tool called data two, which is downstream of this step, which is very savvy about quality control and is able to handle quality control. So this isn't as much of a concern as it used to be when doing this sort of thing, okay? So, so this can guide you in the next step, which is trimming. Uh, and uh, when you go to trim, you might inform yourself by looking at those quality controls. And in this case, you might be inclined to trim uh, at around 100 nucleotides on the reads because there's this dramatic uh, shift, okay? So uh, the trimming occurs during data two and Data2 is a very sophisticated program. It, uh, it uses uh, computer learning to look at your samples. Uh, it assesses the quality of the reads. Uh, it takes forward and reverse reads and puts them together and incorporates information from both directions. It uh, also will identify potential sequencing errors and uh, correct them so that the sequences that you end up analyzing better represent what was really in your sample rather than including sequencing errors from Illumina, okay? Uh, we don't have time to go into all of the details of how that works. It's incredibly powerful and it solved a problem in uh, meta barcoding, which was that you, get, you could get a lot of fake diversity in microbiome and other metabarcoding data because of these errors. And by identifying probable errors and then correcting them, data to minimizes some trouble, okay? So uh, in this case, uh, I trimmed at 220 and 200, okay? And I can show you results, but I wanna show you a new job. You'd uh, just have one opportunity to set up a job when you first do this. And so you add in a truncation length. So for instance, we could try 100. That's the length of the trimmed sequence. And also, if you have some reason to take off some of the left-hand side, you can trim on the left. Uh, it's a little tricky. If you trim left 10 and have a truncation length of 100, you're actually gonna end up with a region from 10 to 120, 110, okay? So I'm not gonna start that. Instead, I'm gonna go back to one of these trims that I've already done, okay? And if I go to the trim table, I can show you some, uh, some filtering that is done, okay? So uh, in, in this case, 
the 24 samples had 510 features. Those are uh, distinct sequences that might represent different species. And a total of 71,000 uh, sequences made it through quality control uh, in this case, okay? So now, rather dramatically, the maximum frequency is way down, but that's because a lot of the sequences were kicked out by data too, okay? Uh, and then there's a table down below that tells us more about the features and their relative uh, quantity within the sample, okay? Um, data two also gives you some statistics on what it got rid of and why. Uh, I'm not gonna go into a great bit of detail because we don't have much time, but it filters based on sequencing quality, it denoises the sequences, it merges them, and then it identifies chimeras, those are mixed sequences and gets rid of them. And in the end, you get this dramatic change in the number of sequences, which is dependent on the quality of the sequencing run, but it makes your data much uh, cleaner and hence better for analyses, okay? Once you've done that, you have to figure out uh, how many sequences you need to look at to get a good representation of what's in your data. That's by running something called alpha rarefaction. So uh, for this, I would identify the maximum number found in the data to output, and I, I enter it into this alpha rarefaction step, Alpha rarefaction is sampling the data at some level and then plotting the number of these representative sequences that show up, okay? So uh, I'm not gonna submit this. Uh, instead, I'm gonna go uh, to a plot that I already did just to show you very briefly, okay? Uh, so you get a plot, you can use different alpha diversity measures, but the one that's intuitive for me is looking at operational taxonomic units, which are like these representative sequences. They're the tentative uh, sequences in there. Oh, sorry, I have to zoom a little bit more. So you get a plot that puts the sequencing depth and on in the other axis, some measure of alpha diversity, in this case, the OTUs. And what you're really hoping is that you'll get to the point where this is horizontal at some number uh, that doesn't quite happen for all of the sequences, or all of the samples. You want it to be e, uh, flat so that you're getting all of the diversity when you sample the data at a certain level, okay? Now, uh, it's a little tricky, but you have to do some compromises here uh, for which we don't have time for, okay? But this gives you an idea of how many sequences you need to look at the diversity, and maybe 1,500 would be good here to get lots of different samples. Some of the samples run out just past 1500 and quite a bit of the diversity is there, but not all of it, okay? You then run something called core metrics and inform yourself uh, through that alpha rarefaction, you know, what level to do. So I can run a new job here and I saw that 1500 might be good. So I could put in 1500, not 1000. 1500, okay. And uh, this is microbiome, so I need to choose the right database. We have green genes and Silva, which are two large databases. Silva is very big and more recent, uh, has been uh, updated more recently. Green genes is smaller. Uh, and if you use our amplicons, you can actually use a version that's just specifically for this amplicon, okay. Uh, again, I'm not gonna run this. But if I submitted this, it would run for a while and I would get results, okay? So uh, once that runs, a bunch of other things show up and these are uh, the measures of diversity. So you can look at alpha diversity in your samples. That's the number of OTUs that you expect to see in them, okay? So I can take a quick look in here and uh, show you an alpha diversity plot. And you can see that there's a very big error in this plot, but, uh, and, I seem to have lost part of my plot off the side there, okay? So this is a measure of alpha diversity, no time to explain it, uh, and it's uh, looking at wild versus captive. So they have roughly the same and very variable uh, diversity in these samples, okay? Uh,
for beta diversity, uh, beta diversity is comparing the diversity between treatments or between samples. So you can compare the samples that way too. Uh, and that lets you tell whether or not samples of one type or another are the same or different. So for instance, I can uh, run an unweighted unifrac distance that, uh, that gives you uh, a measure of how the different types of species are different from each other, but without regard to the fractions of those things, how much there are in there, or a weighted unifrac distance, a different measure, okay? So uh, I'm just running one of these to show you that you can get these really pretty results. Uh, this is a principal component analysis plot. So it's taking the, the beta diversity of the different samples and looking for the major components in there and you can move it around and look at the data. It doesn't mean much when it's all red like that. You can select from your metadata how to separate them. And so by treatment, if you do it by treatment, you can take a look here and by this measure, you can see that there's a lot of distribution of variability and actually it looks like uh, the wolves of different kinds, uh, wild and captive are kind of the same. Okay, so maybe not what Paula would expect. Okay. Uh, the one that most people really get attracted to is looking at taxonomic diversity. So in here, you can get bar plots sort them by taxonomic level and uh, change the colors. So each of these is a different species or a different taxonomic group. And you can sort by treatment or by sample or other metadata. Okay, so by treatment makes the most sense to me. So now uh, wild and captive are on different sides here. And then you can select uh, particular species and highlight them, okay? so. Here I'm selecting some of the more common organisms uh, that were found in these samples. And then you can kind of look at them between these different samples, okay? And unfortunately, I'm uh, going pretty fast because uh, it's a lot to cover in an hour, okay? You can also look at the taxonomy in a list, okay? So you get the taxonomy in a list this is linked to feature IDs, so you can get to the sequence for them by going back to the, uh, uh, the results of data two. Uh, you get the taxonomy, and then you get a confidence level for that assignment. So uh, obviously you want uh, highly confident assign assignments. Uh, if I sort it the other way, uh, you can see that some of the assignments that CHIME 2 gives you can be kind of low, like 0.7 rather than 0.99. Uh, and also the level of the taxonomy is different for different sequences uh, for a number of different reasons. It could be the sequence quality, but more importantly, many, many bacteria share the same barcode. So uh, if you have several species or several genuses that have the same, uh, same sequence for the barcode, you can't tell them apart, okay? Uh, so uh, there, we also have a tool called NICE for looking at differential abundance. Uh, given the amount of time, I think I'll stop with that. I wanted to come very briefly back and uh, uh, go back to the, the uh, PowerPoint. And uh, I'll have to fight my way to the bottom here to let you know about these two grants that we have. Okay, so one, we're part of uh, an NSF I use project. This is a project that's running through 2023 to develop DNA barcoding and meta barcoding course based undergraduate research experiences. Uh, where we're aiming to bring authentic research into the classroom at uh, community colleges and universities. And uh, we're working with uh, James Madison University, uh, City Tech at CUNY, so City University of New York, and Bowie State uh, near Baltimore on this. Uh, we're 
for that, refining these pipelines, both biochemical ones and bioinformatics. And we're disseminating this through workshops and training faculty nationwide uh, so that they can do it. And then we'll support those uh, faculty who participate and choose to implement and uh, with them assess the impact of these uh, cures. Okay, and then of course we're gonna make the cures available to everybody uh, as they are developed. Okay, uh, the whole idea will be to take students and faculty along this sort of big spectrum from uh, sort of doing rote DNA barcoding to hopefully department-wide cures, and then metabarcoding, which is more difficult. We hope to do the same thing. Uh, and for that, uh, just so you know, we have DNA barcoding and metabarcoding workshops coming up in June. Uh, the barcoding workshop will be in Bowie in Maryland, and the metabarcoding workshop will be at City Tech in Brooklyn. Uh, and you can find out more about those on our website uh, dnalc uh, uh, cshl org and edu oops uh, and uh, uh, the information and how to apply is on the website under our educator uh, uh, workshop site okay uh, we're also part of a national center for biotech education uh, and our role is to develop a genomics hub to get biotech students up to speed on genomics and uh, next generation sequencing and uh, things like that. We're gonna have some authentic research in there, but we also are hoping that these students can learn biotech skills while supplying reagents and sequencing services to other people who are doing cures. So that's our model. And that's a national program uh, with over 100 community colleges and, and nearly as many high, school, high schools in the network already, and we're hoping to expand that network even more. Okay, sorry, I've gone over by a little bit. I think it's acknowledgements we wanted to get yeah. to. And uh, so we definitely want to acknowledge those, and hopefully we haven't forgotten anybody uh, who really helped to make this possible. Yeah. So we want to thank you for being with us over this hour where we are at time, but we're gonna stay on for the questions, so Q&A that we do have. Uh, and again, uh, if you need to leave us, uh, you can go ahead and look forward to receiving a communication yeah. with the recorded link. And if you go onto the DNA Subway website, there is a feedback link where you can always contact us. It's also embedded to the documentation. Uh, we're still uh, testing things, and so we wanna make sure that they really are serving you. So thanks to everybody who attended. And we're gonna stay on just to answer those Q&A questions. And I believe most of them are directed to Bruce. Uh -huh. So I'll let him read the questions and then also give you answers. And then we'll wrap up as soon as we're out of questions. Okay, uh, can you add databases different from 16S uh, such as it's? Uh, you can't add those, uh, but we plan to add them. So uh, we're planning to add an RBCL, a C, uh, CO1 and uh, its database. Uh, we're happy to have people ask us for things and we'll do that the best I can. And uh, especially if you have a database, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, let's see, can you use Deebler instead of Data2? Uh, we currently only have Data2 built into our implementation of Chime2. That's again, something that we could put in, but uh, remember that this is meant to be educational. So uh, uh, we're willing to consider that and have thought about it in the past, but at the moment uh, it's not on the sort of near term plans. Uh, can we run against barcode of life database at the moment? Uh, no, uh, that's a good question from Judith Rowe. Uh, uh, other Bruce, so uh, I hadn't thought about adding 18S, but that's a good idea. And uh, especially if you have a database that we could use or can point us towards one, that again would be something that I'm willing to do. Uh, the development of our version of primers takes quite a while. 
So as the number of different uh, regions goes up, uh, for me to develop, test, validate different primers using our approach with the indexes takes quite a while. So uh, we might be able to support you if you got your sequencing done somewhere else much sooner than if you're gonna depend on us for sequencing, okay? Uh, Michael, uh, if you wanna use kits, uh, I tend to use the Kyogen Power Soil kits uh, for soil. Uh, Kyogen has some other kits that are really good. We're working on a non-kit, much cheaper version, uh, but it's not quite ready yet, okay? Uh, I think I answered Cornell's. Uh, Cornell's. Thank you, Uva, for the for the compliment. And uh, if if you want to be involved, Christine, uh, you'd apply to be in a workshop. Uh, people who are in the workshops who then decide to implement, uh, we support them and we try to set you up with mentorship with other people who are doing these things who have done it for a little bit longer. Uh, that's how you would go about doing it. It's competitive to get into the workshops and our target audience at the moment is uh, post-secondary, but if there are spots, you're welcome to join in. And, and there was another question about using NICE um, on Cyverse. So I did search, there is no tutorial outside of this. I know that you can use NICE. Uh, there, are, there are probably several other bioinformatics tools and pipelines that you could use uh, with your DNA subway output. So that one is for looking at micro, um, microbial niche differentiation. Uh, you can export just about every single thing that you have done in, sci in DNA subway so that you can use custom analyses. So all of the, if you're familiar with Chime, all of the Chime artifacts, all of the data files that are produced, you can export those to use those with your choice of tools. So if it's the case that we don't support it currently. Of course, you can always uh, leave us a feedback that you really, really want that tool. And then as uh, we're able to, we try to act on those feedback and, and, and possibly incorporate new tools. A second question, which is probably also I can answer since I'm talking, is about how do you uh, make the data available to other members of the public so that they can use it? And you can do this with Cybers. So uh, you can take data sets, and if those members of the public have a Cybers account, then they can log on and you can just type in their name and see it. But if you just wanna make it generally available, let's say through a website for whoever wants it, please look on the Cybers data store guide. There are instructions on how that's done we can make data sets available for the general public uh, to use in that way. Uh, it just depends a little bit on what you want to do, uh, how we actually do that. Yeah, uh, Callan, uh, if you do a search for nice tutorial, there's a tutorial in the Chime 2 forum that can give you some idea of how it works. Uh, it's pretty complicated. I apologize for not getting it to it today, uh, but the tutorial, get, you know, if you read through it, uh, you'll get a good sense of that. Uh, uh, it's designed for running Chime 2 in command line, so it's a little bit more involved than running in the purple line, but it has a lot of information. Okay. Another one for you? Uh, is it, uh, sorry, so Sarah asked, uh, is it intended that every student run all of the analyses or is it intended for the instructor to run the analyses then share the finished project with the class? Uh, I prefer having the students run the analyses and we've usually done this with teams of two or three, not with whole classes of 24, uh, but maybe having them work in teams and each do analyses in parallel makes sense. But you're right, uh, you asked uh, about the timing. Uh, some of these jobs take really a long time, hours or overnight. Uh, you should plan for that uh, because uh, you're not going to get through the whole analysis in a day. It's something that you have to distribute amongst doing other things. And I know that's uh, maybe not perfect for many classes, 
but it's the nature of this next generation sequencing analysis that that's what you need to do. Okay, so I, I hope that helps solve your question. And, and you know, I'd probably uh, try it ahead of time on your own to get an idea of the timing so that you can plan, if at all possible. Sometimes I know that ends up being hard. Okay, so we've answered all the questions we've gotten. Um, hopefully, if there are others, you can continue to contact us in the future. Yeah. Once again, thanks for those of you who stayed on a little bit longer, uh, enable us to get to some questions you may have had. So we'll be posting this, and we look forward to all of you uh, making use of it, getting feedback, and even making it better. So thank.